Come to Emmanuel. Let's rise to our feet and honor the King of Heaven. Angels proclaim to the shepherds the good news of great joy to everyone, to those alive and to each of us, that Jesus Christ is born, the promise of God had been kept, the Redeemer had arrived. As we light the third Advent candle, we rejoice with the angels that Christ came to set us free from sin, but we also rejoice because we know he will surely come again and make us all new. Luke 2, 8 through 14. And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in a manger and cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace rests to men on whom his favor rests. Bye. 
heavens declare the glory of God. And all of the world will join the praise His wonders proclaim. The oceans and skies lift up their I am the God of all your seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. And nothing is hidden from my view. I see the flowers that are fading. I am aware of the grass that withers. And I see the trees of the field shedding their leaves. And there is a change in the atmosphere. Although the seasons may change, I, the Lord, never change. My love for you is constant and unchanging. And if you believe this with all your heart, then you need not fear. For I am the God of all your seasons of life. I am aware and nothing is hidden from my view.
Hallelujah. Let's be seated. Okay, praise the Lord. Welcome, <clears throat> excuse me, welcome everyone to Emmanuel Church, those of you who are here with us, as well as those of you who are watching online. We welcome you to this uh, third Sunday of Advent as we anticipate celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, already in the process of doing that, really. Uh, we have a few announcements before we get started. I'm going to ask Heather to come up while I'm making a couple of the uh, announcements that we have. Uh, reminders that this afternoon at 2.30, those of you who are able, uh, you can gather here in the parking lot. We will, going to, we will go to Carroll at several of our shut-ins uh, homes. Uh, we'll have instructions for uh, driving instructions to get to those that we're going to when you arrive, and um, we're looking forward to that. We want to be a blessing to those who have not been able to, to be here. Uh, especially in these last months. Following that, or not immediately following, but at 5.30 tonight, those of you who are able to gather here, we are going to be caroling on the portico <clears throat> in the front of the building, particularly aiming a ministry at um, the, the Devon. Uh, we prepared a number of little bags and uh, baskets. We'll be going over there with information about the church and other goodies, and we're hoping that some of those who live on the front of the building will come out on their terraces, and those in the back will gather in the front of the building and, and just enjoy uh, 45 minutes or so of caroling, and it's just a means of outreach. We want to do all that we can to begin to impact our community for the gospel, and um, this is just a part of, of that. So I'm going to ask Heather to come up now. I have a couple more announcements, but if you want to come and make yours. Okay, let me just wipe your microphone. It's probably a little too much. Hopefully I didn't ruin that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So yesterday, today is what, the 13th? We were supposed to have our ladies' Christmas tea. And unfortunately, due to COVID, we, have, were a, we weren't able to gather. So the ladies thought that they would try to do something to encourage every, all of our ladies. And in the back in the narthex is a little gift bag for any of our ladies 16 and older just to offer some encouragement and some words and a gift of friendship and encouragement to you this season. And if you have any questions, there's a little picture in there that we now have a ladies ministry email. Feel free to reach out by email and one of us will get back to you. So, and if you have any questions, come see me. One of the other means of outreach that we have during this season is the angel tree ministry. And uh, last week when you came in, you saw uh, quite a few tags hanging on that tree, all of them that is in the Welcome Center. All of those tags were taken. And apparently there are a number of folks here uh, that gathered here today or we were watching online that were interested in, in uh, getting someone to bless. And unfortunately, we don't have any more tags. Patty Lewis is heading this up. Uh, it's a little difficult now at this point in time for her to get anymore, but we have families among those that we will uh, be ministering to who have additional needs. And so if you want to be a part of this and we're able to get a child to bless with an angel tree gift, please call Patty or call the church office and call the church office and they'll direct you to her, uh, to her number and she will be in touch with you or you can, you can call her. Uh, and speak with her and find out how you can help out. Uh, the needs are, are many, and so um, the lack of tags right now doesn't mean there aren't any more needs. So we'll thank you for uh, participating in that. Those of you who are, are participating, I believe next Sunday is the deadline for getting the, the gifts back here, and they will be distributed, of course, uh, definitely next Sunday because Christmas is at the end of the week, so uh, you want to definitely have them back 
by next Sunday or uh, when you come in or bring them to the church office. All right, I think that takes care of all the announcements, so let's get into the Word, shall we? If you'd like to turn in your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke and the second chapter, we are continuing our Advent series. And today we're in Luke chapter 2. We're going to read beginning in verse 21 through the 39th verse. Luke chapter 2, 21 through 39. I'm reading from the ESV. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This is speaking, of course, of Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts for many hearts, from many hearts may re- be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak to him of all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you again this morning that you have given us the privilege to gather together in your name. And we thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, illuminate your word and give us understanding and insight Lord, may we be challenged by it, and may you accomplish all that you would in each of our hearts. Give us ears to hear what you would say. By your Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I said, we're continuing this morning our Advent series, which Pastor Daniel started two weeks ago, and he's having a much-deserved day off from the pulpit and it's given me the privilege of sharing this morning. So he tasked me with the responsibility of preaching from this passage in Luke chapter 2. He began the series two weeks ago by looking at the life of Zechariah. The theme of our series, of course, is the hope of Christmas. He looked at the hope of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. Last week, he looked at Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the hope of Mary. And today we're looking at two figures here in the Christmas story whose names are probably not mentioned as much as Mary and Joseph 
and the shepherds and the angels or the wise men, but they're part of the Christmas story. In fact, historically speaking, what we read here in Luke chapter 2 takes place before the visit of the wise men. We're looking at two who are important figures in this story surrounding the nativity. They're important, important enough be, they were mentioned in the, in the Gospel of Luke. And they are mentioned because their part in the story is an important one. Simeon and Anna, of course, of, are those of whom we're speaking. So we're talking about the hope of Christmas. And the hope of Christmas is the hope that we have because Christ came, because the Father sent His Son into the world to redeem us from our sins. These two people in our passage today are very clearly people of hope, two followers of God whose hope are squarely placed in Him. So let's look briefly at the background of the passage and then explore more why Simeon and Anna can be seen as people of hope. Verses 21 through 24 serve as the background, the backdrop for our story today. And we saw in the opening verse, it speaks of Jesus being circumcised on the eighth day following his birth. And then Mary and Joseph, his parents, bringing him to the temple in Jerusalem weeks later. So the short answer for why they brought him to the temple is, bec- is this, that they were seeking to follow the Mosaic law. The requirements of the Mosaic law were such that a woman who gave birth was required to bring an offering, a sacrifice, some weeks after that birth took place for purification. This we find in Leviticus chapter 12 and verse 8. Further, it was a time for Mary and Joseph to bring Jesus to the temple to present him to the Lord, according to the command of Exodus 13, 2. And we see that in our passage, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And so, Jesus was brought to the temple to present him to the Lord. I won't say much about all of these, much could be said, but Suffice to say that Mary and Joseph did what they did to meet the requirements of the law. And though the, Jesus was, of course, set apart from birth or from his conception as special for God's purposes, of course, Mary and Joseph saw to it that everything was done on his behalf according to the law. I always like to point out when I speak of the redemptive work of God through Jesus. That while the cross and the resurrection, of course, are central and of utmost importance to our redemption, the life of Jesus is of great importance as well. He lived a sinless, perfect life. He fulfilled the law of Moses perfectly, the Scripture tells us. And though he was without sin, he identified with those he came to save. First, just by means of the incarnation, becoming a man, becoming a baby who was born in that stable and growing to be the man who would redeem us. He identified with his people and with us, those who came to save by the very act of the incarnation and his circumcision and his presentation before the Lord in the temple, we're all part of that identification with the sinners he came to save. And so as a baby, as a child, before he was able, Mary and Joseph and the wisdom that God gave them saw that all the requirements of the law were fulfilled in behalf of Jesus. So this is the backdrop against which Simeon and Anna are introduced to us by Luke. Any thoughtful reading of this passage makes it clear that these two people were people of hope. 
And I want to touch on a few of the reasons that I see in the passage why that is true. We see in them hope that is born out of devotion, a hope that's born out of devotion. Both Anna and Simeon clearly had intimate relationships with the Lord. Let's look at the picture that Luke paints of these two in these verses. Ladies first, let's look at Anna. It is said that she was a prophetess, and there aren't too many women about whom that is said in Scripture, not to say that there were not many prophetesses during the period of time over which the Scripture was written, but only a few are mentioned as prophetesses, and Anna is one of them. She was from the tribe of Asher, and in the Old Testament we see that after the reign of Solomon, the the kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the northern and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, Samaria, the southern kingdom, Judah. And the Samaritans worshipped at a different place in the northern kingdom, while the, those in Judah worshipped at Jerusalem. Anna was a part of Asher, a descendant of Asher, who was part of that northern kingdom. So at some point, her family or she migrated to the southern kingdom and began, began to worship at Jerusalem. And we see that happening with her ministry at the temple. We're told in the latter part of verse 36 that she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. You probably have a footnote in your Bible, as I do, that notes that this could be translated a little differently, and it could possibly be translated as a widow for 84 years. And if that's true, assuming she married even at a very young age, she would have been more than 100 years old. She was an aged woman. And though it's not told us specifically, it's very likely that after the death of her husband, her relationship with the Lord deepened so much so that, and her commitment and devotion to Him, as it says in verse 37, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. Not only is she a a prophetess and a prayer warrior and a worshiper of God, but it tells us also in verse 38 that she was among the first evangelists. Coming up at that very hour when Mary and Joseph brought the baby to the temple and seeing Simeon take him in his arms. Coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And I would take that to mean that not only should she speak to those who were gathered at the temple at that time, but for the remainder of her days in that ministry that she had of prayer and fasting and worship, along with that, she proclaimed him as the Messiah. What a mighty woman of God. In my 40 plus years of walking with the Lord, most of which has been spent here at Emmanuel, I've known quite a few Annas, and I'm sure that most of you here could say the same thing, whether you've spent your years here or elsewhere. You've known many women who would exercise such devotion and commitment to prayer and worship and serving the Lord. Some of them are here today. I think of our dear sister Sarah Thompson and others who have gone on to to glory. What a blessing to know women like that and to also have been the recipient at times of their prayers. Anna was a mighty woman of God, demonstrating hope through the devotion that she had to him. Look at Simeon, 
not unlike Anna in many ways. The first thing that we see in this passage regarding Simeon is that he was a man who was righteous and devout. The righteousness that Simeon had was not a righteousness of his own. Our righteousness, all of us, Isaiah tells us, is as filthy rags before the Lord. Self-righteousness doesn't cut it. He had a righteousness not of his own, but a righteousness that came from God. That righteousness is the righteousness that is imparted to us when we believe and have faith in Jesus Christ. All the way back in Genesis 15, we find that that is the path to righteousness, believing and trusting in God. In Genesis 15, which speaks of Abraham, it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Simeon was a righteous man in the way Abraham was. He believed God and received God's righteousness. It says also that he was devout. And the word here that is translated as devout means this. It literally means taking hold of what is good. It focuses on the outward response someone gives to what they feel is truly worthwhile or worthy of respect. Simeon gave himself to the one who alone is good. His being devout was an outward response to God's goodness and grace and righteousness that had been shown and imparted to him. What else can we know about Simeon from this passage? He was a man upon whom the Holy Spirit rested. Look at verses 25 and 26 again. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to to the custom of the law. The Spirit rested on him and moved in him and through him. It was a demonstration of the intimate relationship that he had with God. He was a Spirit-filled man. What a mighty man of God Simeon was. Devotion to God that is birthed out of an intimate relationship with him brings hope. To the soul. If we know him, how can we not love him? If we love him, how can we not trust him? And if we trust him, how can we not have hope in him? Though not much is said about either of these saints, you can infer from what we do read that they experience the faithfulness of God throughout their lives. Faithfulness that builds trust, trust that built hope because of their devotion to him. How else can we see in this passage that Simeon and Anna are people of hope? Well, we see in them, hope in them, even in the face of disappointment and delay. Although Luke doesn't say that Simeon was an old man, It seems to be implied by his words in verse 29, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. It doesn't necessarily mean that, but it is very likely that he was an older man, perhaps similar in age to Anna. Most scholars and Bible teachers agree with that. If we can assume that's true, then both of our subjects in this passage are near the end of their lives. And while they had seen God's faithfulness, they no doubt, like all of us, also had their share of hardship. We've already seen that it's said of Anna that she became a widow just seven years after she was married. She never remarried, and although it doesn't say, likely did not have the blessing 
of a family or children. But despite all this, Anna remained faithful to the Lord. She clung to the Lord and served him with abandon. We see it in what we've already read about her through worship and prayer and fasting and evangelism. Even in the face of disappointment, she remained faithful to him. We read about uh, read nothing about Simeon's personal life, but we're told that God made a promise to him that he would see the Messiah before death closed his eyes. And it may have been that that promise was made to him much earlier in his life and that he had to wait patiently for that promise to be fulfilled. So what we have in Luke's gospel is a picture of endurance in the face of disappointment and delay in the lives of Simeon and Anna. We have no indication that Simeon ever wavered in the belief that God would fulfill his promise to him, that he would see the Messiah. We see only faithful commitment on the part of Anna the prophetess. They serve as examples to all of us. When we experience disappointment, we need to hold fast to the Lord. In the most difficult of times, we need to cling to Him and continue to trust in Him that He has our lives in His hands. When we experience delay in a promise that we've received from the Lord or something for which we have been praying, we need to keep asking and keep seeking, keep knocking, and keep believing that God will do what he has promised he will do. Waiting isn't easy, but Isaiah tells us in the 40th chapter of his book that they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength and they will mount up with wings as eagles. So we see hope in Simeon and Anna, even in the face of disappointment and delay in their lives. Excuse me. We also see hope in them embracing the new. We see hope in them in embracing the new. What do I mean by that? Anna and Simeon represent the old, not just in their physical age, but the old in the sense like capital O if it was on the screen. They were part of the Old Covenant. Pastor Daniel pointed out a couple of weeks ago that the time between the, New Test- the Old Testament and the New Testament is often referred to as the silent years because there were no inspired writings that are contained in our scriptures that were written between Malachi and Matthew. But as he so uh, well correctly pointed out, It doesn't mean that God was not at work. He was, in fact, at work. He was working behind the scenes to bring about his perfect will. It says in Galatians chapter 4, Paul's epistle in the fourth verse, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. There were still prophets and prophetesses in that intertestamental time. And Simeon, if we can call him one, he certainly does prophesy. Perhaps didn't have the office of prophet, but we could probably call him one. And Anna for certain, because it says that she was a prophetess. These were two who were prophets. These were two who were part of the old covenant, and yet they knew that something new and profound and miraculous was coming. All of the prophets of the Old Testament longed to see the day that the Messiah would come, but these two had the privilege and the honor of actually seeing it. These two somewhat obscure figures 
who we read about in Luke's second chapter. They saw him. And literally for Simeon, and figuratively speaking for both of them, they embraced him. And therein they found the greatest hope that they could ever imagine. Some 30 years later, after the inauguration of Jesus in his ministry, we read of Jesus forgiving the sins and healing of a paralytic, eating with sinners for which he is criticized on both counts, and question as to why his followers do not fast like those of John the Baptist, and a dozen other things that were thrown against him, criticisms, mainly from the religious leaders of his, his time. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, against whom he leveled harsh criticism. Those teachers of the law and the Pharisees could not see what was happening. Their eyes were blind. Simeon and Anna had no such problem embracing the new. Listen to what Alexander McLaren, a 19th century Scottish preacher and um, commentary writer, says about these verses in Luke chapter 2. He says this, quoting, I may, though only in a sentence or two, point out that that relation of the new to the old is one that recurs in every generation. It is well for the new when it consents to be taken in the arms of the old, and it is ill for the old when instead of welcoming, it frowns upon the new. And instead of playing the part of Simeon and embracing and blessing the infant, plays the part of Herod and seeks to destroy the child that seems to threaten its sovereignty. We old people who are conservative, if not by nature, by years, and you young people who are revolutionary and innovating by reason of your youth, may both find a lesson in that picture in the temple of Simeon with the infant Christ in his arms. End quote. In 1 Samuel 16, we read about Samuel, the prophet and judge in Israel at the time, going to the house of Jesse at the Lord's command to anoint the one who would take the place of King Saul as the new monarch in Israel. And all of Jesse's sons passed before him, the older boys. And Samuel said, surely this is the one, but no, it isn't. Or surely this is the one. He's not the one either, God says. And he goes through all of Jesse's sons, he thinks, and asks Jesse, are there no others? And he said, well, there's one more. My youngest son, he's out in the field tending the sheep. His name's David. And David comes in, and God says, he's the one. Anoint him as the new king of Israel. To his surprise and everyone else's. When Simeon walked into the temple that day, it's not likely that he expected to see the baby of a working class family in his mother's arms as the fulfillment of the promise that God had made to him probably many years before. But the Holy Spirit, we see, spoke to Simeon and revealed to him that he was indeed the one. When Mary hears the prophetic words of Simeon in verse 34, and let's read that, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. 
When Mary heard those words, it's not likely that she expected to hear what was the first inkling of the suffering Messiah, her son. But ultimately, she embraced the plan that had been laid and established from the foundations of the world. Whether we're young or old in years, we always must be looking for and embracing God's plans for both us individually and for the body of Christ and for the kingdom of God. His plans may not look like what we expect, but we need to always be prepared to submit to his purposes. The scripture says that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. We need to be ready to submit to his purposes and to the overarching story which he gives us the blessed opportunity to be a part of. But it's his story to write and to tell. As we begin to close, let's look again at the words of Simeon in verses 29 through 32 and read that. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. This is the fourth and final song in the Nativity account here in the book of Luke. Pastor Daniel referred to two of them in his messages. In the first week, he spoke about Zechariah's song, which is known in Latin as the Benedictus. Last week, he spoke about Mary's song, which is known as the Magnificat. And then there's the third song of the angels, the Gloria in Excelsis. And this is the last of the four songs in the Gospel of Luke, known as the Nunc Dimittis. And the Latin refers to the 29th verse and means, now you dismiss. It's interesting, in this 29th verse, the first word is Lord, or sovereign Lord, depending on your translation. But the Greek word for Lord here is one that's only used twice in the New Testament. And the word is despota. Despota. If it sounds familiar, the root of that English, uh, of our English word, despot, comes from that. Usually the word despot refers to a tyrant but it doesn't have to. It means one who is an absolute roller. And one can be, if you will, a benevolent despot. And that may describe the Lord well. He is absolutely the sovereign ruler who loves us, but sent his son to save us and to make us a people of hope. His plans cannot be changed. His truth is irrefutable. So then let us as his people align ourselves with his plans and purposes, recognizing that we, like Simeon, as he calls himself in this 29th verse, are bond servants committed to the absolute rule of God in our lives to carry out his plan and his purpose as he sees fit. Let's find hope in embracing the new thing that God may be doing in our lives, in our church, in the body of Christ as a whole. Let's not have that attitude that was prevalent among those religious leaders 
in the time of Jesus' ministry, but rather that of Simeon and Anna, and embrace which what we know God is doing. One final point regarding hope in this story. Simeon says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. Neither Simeon nor Anna would live to see the ministry of Jesus inaugurated. They wouldn't live to see the day that that baby that they declared as the Messiah fulfill the plan of salvation through his death and resurrection. But their joy and their peace was in no way diminished. They had bright hope for tomorrow, as that hymn that we sing so beautifully says. But not only bright hope for tomorrow, they had bright hope for 10,000 times 10,000 tomorrows because they knew what Jesus had come to do. When you have the eternal hope that comes from knowing that Jesus is Messiah, Lord, and Savior, there is no fear of death. Hope will not disappoint. As the songwriter Matt Redman wrote, and on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. 10,000 years and then forevermore. Today in heaven, Simeon and Anna are beholding the face of the one who they saw as a baby in the temple in Jerusalem. But now he is reigning glorious in majesty. Hope does not disappoint. As we close, I would invite anyone here today in the sanctuary or any of those of you who are watching online to come and give your life, if you have not done so, to this one who came to save you from sin and death and hell and to give you hope in this season. It requires nothing more than saying yes to Jesus. I believe you died for me. I receive the forgiveness of sins that you secured on the cross and the eternal life that you bring through your resurrection. And I ask you to come into my life, turn my life around, use me for your purpose, for the glory of God and your kingdom. That's all it takes. Let's pray together as we close. And the worship team will then lead us in one final song. Father, we thank you for these saints about whom we've read in this passage today, who we know even today are rejoicing in your presence. And someday, because we know you also as the one who came to save us, we will rejoice with them in your presence. I pray, Lord, that if there are any in the sound of my voice, whether here in this sanctuary or watching at home or wherever, who do not know you, that they would reach out to you this morning in this season of hope, that they would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. We ask your blessing, Father, on our people as we go forth. We pray, Lord, that as we proclaim that message of hope to those this afternoon and this evening who will hear the caroling, that you would encourage their hearts and draw them to yourself. We bless you. We praise you. We honor you. We thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
step down to darkness Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Walk for a life spent bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you. Lord, be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Hallelujah. Be led by the Spirit in Jesus' name.